Good afternoon, Professor Van Loo. Thank you for, so much for being with us. Thank you for inviting me. We will uh, uh, talk a little bit about your experience on deliberation. So, how do you achieve uh, an effective deliberation in view of rendering a timely award? There are six things that come to mind. The first is the need for all of the tribunal to keep an open mind on the case. Uh, each arbitrator will have their own view of the, the facts and the legal issues, but it's important for each of them to remember that they may not be right, and that other explanations may be uh, more plausible, more persuasive as a matter of law, and to keep that openness right the way through the, the deliberations. I think the second thing is the crucially important meeting straight after the hearing has ended. And unless you have a meeting very quickly after the uh, hearing's ended, uh, the temptation is to leave it, come back to it in a few weeks. But by that time, the memory of the evidence that has been given and of the submissions of the parties starts to fade. And apart from the fact that it involves a, a lot more work, uh, I think you lose the overall picture of the case that you get if you have a meeting straight away. Third thing, I think, is preparation. And... I think the more preparation an arbitrator can do before the deliberations, indeed before the hearing, the better, and to work through the discipline of, for instance, drawing up a chronology which is keyed into the, the documents is extremely useful, just in giving the case a shape so that you can see how submissions and pieces of evidence fit in and you're not trying to construct that structure during the, the case. And then that follows through into the deliberations because you've got the, the framework there in front of you. Fourth point, I think, uh, having arbitrators who have not only legal skills but social skills. And deliberation is a, a conversation, it's an attempt to persuade, and uh, the easier people find to uh, interact with each other, the easier the deliberations are. And certainly, uh, I've been very fortunate in having very personable uh, and congenial colleagues on tribunals, and there's no doubt that that has helped uh, deliberations a lot. And a couple of other points. I, the pleadings, I think, are crucial to effective and swift deliberations. The more concise they are, the clearer they are, the shorter they are, uh, the better, because the pleadings themselves give the tribunal a sense of uh, the case which the, ex the parties expect to see in the award. And the last thing I'll mention, which uh, I've tried in one or two cases, is actually inviting the parties to draw up a list of the questions that they want the tribunal to decide. And that gives a very clear focus to the award and a clear structure for the negotiations as well. Uh, and of course it ensures that the party's expectations in terms of the issues that are addressed by the tribunal are not going to be disappointed. Thank you. Let me follow up on a couple of the issues you mentioned. Uh, what are the advantages of having an in-person deliberation compared to the one via email or by phone call? Well, people always say that uh, 60, 70, 80% of communication is non-verbal, that actually sitting with someone, being able to see their face, watch their body language, and so on, carries uh, more information than is carried in words alone. So I think there's no comparison between uh, in-person deliberations and email conversations. Uh, and it also helps the, the bonding process of the tribunal, and the confidence, the understanding of where different tribunal members are coming from in their positions. So having a basis in in-person deliberations, I think, is crucial. But having said that, I don't think it's necessary that every session should take place in person. And one thing that does uh, trouble me sometimes about arbitration is the enormous amount of cost and money and, and time that is spent in going to hearings and uh, other meetings when in fact a video conference or a telephone conference might do just as well. It's something I think you have to judge uh, on its merits at each point in the process to see whether it's something that's appropriately done by uh, telephone or by video or by in-person meeting. So 
you draw attention to the in-person, the importance of in-person deliberation or at least some meetings in person among the tribunal's member. How many sessions do you deem uh, appropriate and when to organize them? Well, I think it's helpful to have one meeting of the tribunal before the hearing takes place. Um, some people do that very close to the hearing, just a day or two before, uh, to go over any issues that they think are likely to come up in the conduct of the proceeding uh, or any big issues that have, appear on the substance of the, of the case. Then I've already mentioned the great need that there is for a, a meeting immediately after the, the hearing. And I think you also need a, a third meeting of the tribunal to go through the full legal part of the award. Uh, quite often, if the case has been separated out into different issues, a tribunal can come to decisions on each of those issues. But there's also the question of making the award coherent and making sure that it all fits together. And that's not an editing process. That's a, a deliberation process where I think everybody needs to be together and around the table to discuss it. Wonderful. Um, so what are the, your view on the retreat? meaning having a pre-hearing deliberation and putting questions to the parties before the hearing? Well, I think that can be very helpful. And I certainly think that uh, giving guidance to the parties on uh, the issues which the tribunal thinks have, have been fully briefed and issues where the tribunal has some remaining questions they would like to see more in the way of submissions for the, the parties. And that must help everybody because nobody wants to waste uh, their time in putting forward pleadings that are going to have no uh, no additional effect over and above what they've already done. Uh, but I think it's also important to keep an open mind when you go into the hearing as regards the perspective on the case. And the tribunal may not see the case in the way that one or both of the parties sees the case. So I think they have to be free to frame the case and put it forward as they like. So in many ways, my personal preference is not so much to emphasize the pre-hearing meeting between the tribunal in order to guide the parties, but to emphasize the interaction between the tribunal and the parties as the hearing goes on. So that meetings uh, between the arbitrators during the course of the the proceedings to just review the day's work and so on can be helpful. It's not that I've got anything against the Reed retreat, but uh, even on the most spiritual retreats, I think their value is greatest when people come back into the real world and the equivalent for the arbitrator is bringing the product of that back into their relationship with the, the people pleading in front of them. You touch upon the fact that it's very important for an effective deliberation to have the parties submitting good uh, pleadings or having good pleadings. How you can advise them to better prepare for that? Well, I think all tribunal members would say that uh, clear, concise uh, and short pleadings are better than the, the opposite. Uh, it's a matter of style to a degree, but there is sometimes a tendency to put in all possible arguments just as a safety net so that no one can turn around later and say why did you not plead this or that. Uh, a lot of the time it's redundant and a lot of the time it leads to repetitions in pleadings when the same facts are turned over and over again uh, as background for claims under different provisions in the, the BIT. So I think trying to get a clear view of the, the simple narrative of what the case is and just put that simple case out uh, in its strongest form, that's the, the best advice. And then there's another practical thing, which is partly a question of the efficiency of the deliberations. It's more a question of efficiency in the conduct of the arbitration as a whole. And that is, I think there's a lot of room for the parties to agree on matters that they put forward. The obvious example is uh, bundles that are given to the tribunal during the hearing, where uh, every tribunal will be used to having a pile this high of uh, materials which they're given each day, many of which are duplicated uh, as between individual files. The idea of having an agreed bundle of key documents, perhaps with a supplement from claimant and a supplement from 
were respondent would make life a lot easier. And something else which would also be uh, very helpful, which a uh, number of domestic courts do, for instance, is having agreed statements of facts. I think a lot of effort is spent in uh, ICSID and tribunals in drawing up the preliminary paragraphs uh, in pleadings which recite the facts, the procedural history and so on. It's not obvious to me that that is particularly controversial much of the time or that the parties uh, are particularly anxious that the tribunal should spend a lot of time on those matters and the obvious solution is to try to get an agreed statement of uh, that part of the award from the parties. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for sharing with us your insight of how to make uh, the deliberation more effective. It's a pleasure.